So I would like to introduce the candidates, and perhaps they can, uh, you know, just indicate who they are as, with a show of hands, or if you want to stand up. And I'm just going to read it, read the order that I have in front of me. And I have Matthew Lund from the Green Party of Canada, Jessa McLean, the New Democratic Party, Sean Tanaka, the Liberal Party of Canada, John Trammell, an Independent. Dory Baxter and Progressive Canadian Party, Robert Gertz, People's Party of Canada, Keith Dean Kumar, Libertarian Party of Canada, Adam Sir, National Citizens Alliance, and I'm not sure Scott Davidson. Scott Davidson? He did reply. Okay, he did not reply, and he represents the Conservative Party of Canada. So. There are five questions, and all five questions will be asked of each candidate. And as Yvonne indicated, we will be um, asking the audience for their questions, and we'll be accepting three questions from the audience. So I think I will start, and we'll just go in the order of um, what? beside me. We'll start with uh, Tessa here. And I'll start with the first question, and then we'll just go straight down, and then I'll just change up the order for question number two. No opening statements? Opening, opening remarks first. You see, that's where the forgiveness part comes in. There we go. <laughs> okay, two minutes for opening remarks. Thank you. Justin? All right, so my name is Jessa McLean. I'm with the New Democratic Party of Canada. And uh, we've been knocking on doors since mid-December, and what we're finding is that at our root, we are all really affected by the same issues, right? We have a lack of affordable housing. We need well-paying jobs. All of us are concerned about the environment. And uh, we are going to talk about a lot of those issues here today in, in, in detail. And when we do, I ask that you really ignore the slogans, okay, and empty acknowledgments that there's an, a problem. We need solutions. So don't let the parties rest on previous records because every single year inequality grows. Every single year. And we've gone between red and blue as a nation for far too long with no real political will aimed at any ending inequality. So we don't need another four years of big business lobbyists influencing our government. We need real working class representation. We need a strong voice in Ottawa. Think of the possibilities if we act boldly. We have an amazing plan to transition to renewable energy away from fossil fuels that will stimulate our economy, provide green jobs, and endless opportunities for our communities. We can provide pharmacare that will actually save us money in the long run and save lives. Affordable housing. The NDP is the only party with a real plan to tackle affordable, unaffordable housing, which our riding suffers from greatly. So don't let them tell you any of this cannot be done. I want you to listen with very open minds and make the right choice and really reimagine what is possible. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sean Tanaka and I'm the Liberal candidate in this by-election. Um, but that's not all that I am. I'm also a local resident that I grew up here and I live here. Um, I'm also a mom to twin boys, Kyle Cass. I'm also a local volunteer for the East Glenberry Library Board, for the Sharon Temple Museum Society, for the Maytree Foundation, which focuses on social injustices and the reduction of poverty. Uh, I'm also married to a man named Sean, so if anybody thinks that I'm talking about myself in the third person, I'm actually referring to my husband. Um, and I'm also a university professor. Um, in geography, and so I have a lot of experience when it comes to social cultural geography, teaching in areas of globalization, and social inequalities, um, and critical race, uh, critical race theory. Um, so part of the reason why I'm running for the Liberal Party is it aligns with my values. I think one of the things as a mom who's raising kids and knows how challenging that is, I'm really proud of the Canada Child Benefit. It goes to over 20,000 children in this community. And that's substantial. When I was talking with the Minister of Families on the weekend, he was saying the average is only 12,000 in most areas. 
So the, it, the need in this community is there. Um, and so I'm, I want to make sure that this tax fee benefit goes to where it needs to. Um, and then it's also something that's costed. It's to, it, we have been able to reduce the taxes for the middle class by asking the one percenters to pay a little more. And so that's how we're able to do that and make it more substantial for the family that needs it. But there's more that we can do. There's more that needs to be done. And that's why I want to be the strong voice, the progressive voice that goes to Ottawa and works alongside the federal government to bring back those resources that we need. Thank you. My name is Dorian Baxter, and I represent the original Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, the party of Sir Johnny MacDonald. We were the ones that refused to accept the illegitimate merger. We sued the Harper government, took us four years, and we seized back the PC party logo. But I, I mention that because we are now the only party, would you believe, in Canada that actually follows what is called the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy. That model says from the inception of Canada, nobody should be voting for the party. They should vote for the person that has the strongest voice and the deepest commitment for the people of the community. I believe that I can be that person if you will send me to offer. In fact, one of my mottos uh, it is, uh, I, one of my hobbies is doing Elvis. I put the hair forward. I won the, the Collingwood thing 23 years ago. But one of my mottos is send me to Ottawa and they'll be all shook up. Oh. So uh, I, I, I do want to let you know, though, since we're talking about qualifications, I hope you'll take time. The Bradford newspaper did an article. It's over there. My flyers. I hope you'll, you'll take time to get one of those. But you know, in terms of qualifications, I got my BA from York University in Humanities, my master's degree from the University of Toronto, and for 17 years I was a past associate professor with Drake University, educating teachers. I had many from the Catholic School Board that took university courses with me. I also um, was ordained at the uh, St. James Cathedral uh, in Toronto, May 15, 1983. And I want you to know that I'm giving half my salary back to fight poverty here. So for half the price of one MP, you're going to get four. Because I'm a blue liberal, I'm a red Tory, greener than the Greens, and I guess my time's up. Thank you very much. His timing doesn't start till now. <laughs> See, already I'm solving problems. <laughs> uh, my name is Keith Kobar. I'm the candidate for the Libertarian Party of Canada. We are the party of choice. Uh, I'm a bricklayer by trade, so I'm, I'm not a career politician. I'm, I'm not here for a career. I'm not here to have a conversation with you. And tonight, our conversation I wanted to have was about what we hear a lot about the left and right. Everybody's been pushing further and further left, right? And then the conversation is lost on what we should really be talking about, that's the authoritarian side versus the libertarian side. And we're actually the opposite of authoritarian. Authoritarians, we know them from history, people like Stalin and then the such who want to dictate your lifestyle to you. And libertarians don't believe in that. We, we believe that personal choice is the way to go. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between equity and opportunity and equity and outcome. And a lot of the parties here, they always talk about where we're going to make everything equal for everybody at the end. And, and it's an impossibility. It, to, to, to succeed in this world, you have to have personal effort. You have, you have to put things in yourself. But we'd like to see everybody have a, an equal opportunity to do that. And, and that's where we should be talking about. The equity that we need to be discussing is, is having an opportunity to succeed giving people the choice and the chance to succeed. So really that's, that's where I want to go with this tonight is, is let's, not, let's not get lost in the fact that they're going to take our, our, our money and, 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 and make everything equal at the, at the end game. And let's, let's give people a choice and a chance to succeed on their own. Thank you. I'm Johnny Engineer Turmel. I stand because I don't want to whack anybody. 
Now, January last month, the Global Mail reported that half of Canadians are 200 bucks away from being broke. Not you people, but your kids and your grandchildren are going to suffer. Now, I put my program to verse, 96 seconds. Canada's Debt National had much stability till 1974 starts exponentiality. Same in Ontario, Quebec, debt's doubling over time. Did debts all start to grow in big coincidence to mine? The Bank of Canada once made loans to provinces and fed without the interest that causes budgets to turn red. With only depreciation and re repair so easily affordable without the banker's share. But in 1974, Pierre Trudeau cut the fee, said no more interest-free loans for infrastructure need. All governments must borrow now new funds from private banks and raise new tax to service interest with bankers' banks. But worse, in 1968, Pierre lifted the cap on interest from 6% to 60. That's the wrap. In 12 years, central bank rate went to 22%. More tax to pay greater debt at higher rates was spent. <coughs> oh, God, how did we lose that? <laughs> All right, so Pierre Trudeau is responsible for debts out of control, for lifting rate cap, ending infrastructure loans, his role. Oh, God, so little time. Our taxes disappeared since over 40 years ago. Um, since Pierre, uh, for interest on Trudeau's debt, we didn't have to owe. If we got that two trillion tax, since Pierre had helped banks us fleece, dividing back the cash is 60 grand a piece. So your kids could all have 60 grand a piece in their bank accounts if you let me reprogram the computer instead of being 200 bucks away from broke. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you to the Social Planning Committee for putting on this event. Uh, I know everybody got to brave the cold. And uh, I'm sorry not all the candidates can be here, but really I'm sure for the candidate that isn't here, you'll be able to find him at one of his pay for access $500 play dinners. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to uh, just uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matthew Lund. I'm running on the Green Party ticket. Uh, I myself am a uh, member of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm a small business owner. I'm a family man. I believe in small business, and I know how to actually advocate for small business. Um, as a, for trade, I am a paralegal. I've worked in big city law firms, and now I run my own practice. I spent my career helping people with, with certain issues, certain things like helping small businesses get debt recovery. I've helped families that have to get displaced, and I helped a little guy against the big corporations. Um, I'm here to dispel the mess about the, regarding the Green Party that have been skewed by the other parties. We are the party that is fiscally progressive and small business centric, while at the same time forward thinking with socially progressive ideas. We are the middle ground that looks at universal health care as our most important political achievement as a country and not just a financial burden that some of the parties might have in belief. So for all of the, those of you that have lost faith in this corrupt system of politics that has eroded our fundamental and core principles as human beings, the Green Party looks at a holistic approach, identifying the root cause of any issue with full cost accounting. We are the party that is your source for economic and social freedoms. You all have a very special uh, role to play here. This isn't a, an election where you have to worry about electing a party. You don't have to strategically vote. You can vote your conscience in this election. Vote for a candidate that's actually going to represent you. It's eight months till the next, uh, next federal election. You can vote for what is right. When seeking a candidate to represent you in Ottawa, don't look at the flash and mythology of the status quo. Look for change that will truly represent yours and your family's best interests. Vote Green for 2019. Thank you. My name is... Are we on? Yep. Yeah. My name is Robert Gertz. Um, I'm running for the People's Party of Canada. That's the Maxine Bernier party that broke off from the Conservatives. Maxine broke off from the Conservatives because uh, she found them to be too morally and intellectually corrupt to run the country. <clears throat> we have a financial crisis coming, and it's going to wipe, possibly wipe us out. Here's what's happening. Uh, for 2039, 
we are going to hit a $1.1 trillion debt federally that's on top of the provincial debt. <clears throat> Do you remember how pompous Trudeau was when on 2015 he said, we're going to, um, we, we're going to have a, a cabinet of people in gender? And, and somebody said, why? And he said, because it's 2015. Well, guess what he did in 2016? He quietly moved into the regulations that you now have to declare your principal residence in your income should you sell the house. You don't have to pay a tax yet, but do the math. Trudeau is clearing a path to tax your principal residence. With a $1.1 trillion debt coming in 2039, where is he going to pay for this? Where are all of these candidates going to pay for all of this? Marijuana. Let's <laughs> <laughs> hope. Or he's coming for your house. I am here to warn you that the People's Party is here to represent the people. Because guess what? The corruption on the is in the liberals and the conservatives, and they are intellectually and morally corrupt. That's all. Good evening, people of York Senate. I am Adam Sir, your National Citizens Alliance candidate in the upcoming by-election. The National Citizens Alliance is a party that aims to revolutionize the Canadian political scene to put more decision-making power in the hands of Canadians. This has come about as a result of talking to Canadians from all walks of life about their wants and needs and what has been revealed as government corruption and mismanagement that has been going on for decades. The Canadian people want more than just to be able to vote someone out of office. They want to be able to recall them from their posts, and that includes the Prime Minister. Canadians want to see a more efficient and streamlined government with less bureaucracy and more functionality. Canadians want immigration policies that benefit Canada and that puts the safety and well-being of Canadians first. Canadians want the return of the Bank of Canada that belongs to the Canadian people and not private enterprise. Canadians do not want our sovereignty sold out to unelected and irresponsible organizations like the United Nations. In short, Canadians want government to be responsible to the people once again, <laughs> not subverted to globalist interests. National Citizens Alliance is a true grassroots party that represents uncontrolled opposition to the status quo, which has left so many Canadians living at or below the poverty line and homeless. Our seniors and veterans are being ignored. Part of the National Citizens Alliance mission is to approve the Canada Pension Plan benefits for our seniors and benefits uh, to our veterans. NCA is also dedicated to improving and simplifying the taxation structure for all Canadians and Canadian business ventures in order to stimulate a more self-sufficient economy. Please support the National Citizens Alliance. Again, my name is Adam Sir. Okay, thank you, Candice, for your opening statement. You provided ample information on your uh, platform in a general sense. So now we're going to go into some specific questions with specific topics. And I believe we'll start with the Liberal Party of Canada candidate, Sean Tanaka, and then we'll move down in the same sequence. And I will read the question. A growing, num a growing concern among Canadians, middle-income earners, as well as working class, is in the inability to make ends meet. The cost of living is outstripping the incomes of the majority of Canadians. In your opinion, what are the factors that have led to the disproportionate income inequality, and what are your plans to address it? Thank you. So, yes, it is getting harder, income inequality. And, oh, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, yes, so to address this issue, one of the first things that the Liberal government did was lower the income tax for 
um, those that fall in the middle class. And how they were able to afford to do that was taxing the one percenters at a higher rate. The other thing that we were able to achieve was the Canada Child Benefit that I mentioned in my introduction. And it's a tax-free benefit that goes to 20,000 children in New York and Coke so that they can use it as they best see fit. So some people will use it for after-school programs, some will use it for nutritious food, some will use it for school supplies. Um, but it's one of those things that I think makes a real difference in this community. And on the national scale, it actually raised 300,000 children out of poverty. So I think that that is a great beginning. Um, but of course, there, there's more to do. We do have a strong economy. We have created over 900,000 jobs. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize the time was right. Thank you. I uh, have to say that one of the things that the PC party wants to do is to encourage the growth of small businesses in this area. And one of our concerns is that the taxes need to be more realistic. They need to be reduced so that we, so we can see these small businesses beginning to blossom and flourish again. The other thing that concerns me, particularly in this area, I, I lived in this area in, in Bradford, raised my two daughters in Bradford actually, and what has concerned me is the middle class which is ever disappearing are struggling with their children who want to go to university and I have a plan, we have a plan. The federal government has been shirking its responsibility toward our students and we have many brilliant students that can't even think about going to university. We should be funding undergraduate degrees for those students that show the promise. Also, I think one of the most important things with regard to the, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just read my flyer, thank you very much. <laughs> I think I'm loud enough, I don't think I need to have a microphone. Um, the real problem here is, is twofold. First off, our debt is well under control. We're at almost $700 billion now, and uh, this all kind of started in 1974, but the next problem is the inflating of the currency. Um, a few of the older folks here would understand that their dollar used to go a lot further back in the day, and through inflation of that currency, the value is gone in that money. So. First off, we've stolen all of your savings. I apologize for all that because that's, that's a shame that, that our country does not take the seniors in this country. But the real solution is fixing our currency for this this whole issue. We need, to, we need to get the Bank of Canada back in control of our money, get it over the hands of the international bankers, and start creating our own money again. And that would fix a lot of these these issues. I agree. Obviously, for those people computer literate, I want you to be able to log on to the Bank of Canada's computer, like PayPal, open an account. But instead of pledging a credit card, you pledge a thousand hours of labor. And now you use that interest-free credit line at the Bank of Canada to settle all your mortgages and interest-bearing debts. And then after that, all your payments go against principal. And someday, you're out of debt. Has anyone ever explained to you how to get out of debt before? To pay it off completely? If you got access to the Bank of Canada's computer, if you got a central bank account, someday you'll be out of debt. Well, you older guys are going to stay in debt forever, but your kids could get out of debt if they wise up like you guys never did. Remember, you're the ones who let them tell you that raising interest rates fights inflation. Raising cost of production brings prices down, and you bought it. I didn't. So the question is, what causes the inequality in, uh, in our economic uh, prosperity? And quite simply, the answer is, is the ping-ponging back and forth between liberal, liberal and conservative politics. Because rather than moving the country progressively, it's always a revenge system of every time you elect uh, one or the other party, they're going to just simply try to undo everything that the last party did. So we need to get away from that model. We need to start moving towards a progressive future. And in that, I think that the number one thing we need to do to fix economic inequality 
is bring corporate taxes back to 2009 levels. If we do that, we're going to have uh, nearly $40 billion extra that we can actually use to create a national basic uh, guaranteed livable income. Some people might disagree with that format, but right now we're in a situation where over the next 10 years, nearly 50% of the jobs that currently exist in Canada, the most basic jobs that people have like trucking, retail, manufacturing, are all going to be automated and people are going to be out of work. So we need to actually start moving towards a system that actually benefits everybody and a national basic guaranteed local income is the first step in that path. There's been wage stagnation, there's no doubt about it. When I started as a prosecutor 30 years ago, my salary was between 30 and 40 thousand dollars. How many of the millennials are starting out exactly at that rate right now? Uh, the millennials are the generation screwed, okay? We've, we've left them out and they're going to be left holding the bag. The People's Party of Canada has a three-part plan to basically generate jobs and basically get rid of the um, income inequality that exists. One, a 15% flat tax for everyone between $15,000 and $100,000 right across the board. The first 15000 is also tax-free. Then we get rid of capital gains, okay? So all of you can now cash out your RSPs as you see fit and invest money. And then finally, the, uh, lower the corporate tax rate from 15% to 10%. So that basically we can re you know, regenerate small business. Okay, for the inequality and economic prosperity, National Citizens Alliance is definitely very concerned for our citizens. There will be a 7% reduction immediately in the uh, personal income tax. The mortgage tax will be deductible. We will implement a three-tiered tax, uh, under $22,000, there will be no tax whatsoever. $22,000 to $200,000 will be a 15% tax, and finally, greater than $200,000 will be 25% tax. As far as the corporate tax, we're going to keep pretty much the same rules with the exception of a flat uh, tax of 9%. We will eliminate the capital gains on small business that will allow our young entrepreneurs and workers uh, to be able to uh, acquire the jobs they desperately need. Thank you. Okay, thank you to the candidates. Um, yes, I'm going to rebuttal. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Forgive this okay, so the question's about in income inequality and why it persists, and I'll be honest with you, it's because we continue to prop up a system that is designed to create inequality. So yes, our economy might boom and bust, but in the end, that only really benefits the same people over and over again. And the policies that we've gone through as a nation, back and forth between liberals and conservatives, are all very similar. You can talk about the child tax benefits, and you can talk about tax cuts, but really there is no political will in Ottawa to fight back against the ultra-rich. They take their donors from the same people, and they are beholden to make decisions that do not eat into these profits. As a grassroots organizer, I have faced that uphill battle of what happens when the economic elites are total influence on our, our legislation and our government. We cease to be a priority in that case. We need to send people to Ottawa that are not beholden to corporations, that take only donations from their community, and so when they get there, they are beholden to nobody but their community members. That's how we'll fight inequality. Thank you. Yes, we will allow four candidates to rebut, and just to remind you that uh, there's 30 seconds for rebuttal, and the Green Party of Canada candidate Matthew Lund has indicated he wishes to rebut, as well as the... Okay, go through them. So, we'll, we'll start with uh, the Green Party of Canada, yes. So, you know, everybody is always afraid of ta uh, taxing. And, and certainly I am as well. The problem is, is that if you start cutting taxes from everything, then you're going to start cutting taxes to so, uh, cutting funding to very pivotal and important programs. It's no different than the Ford Nation right now, cutting all of these uh, social programs, things like all the funding towards autism, all the funding towards education, and soon there's no funding left for anything. 
So while taxes may seem like a controversial issue, they are important in order to actually fund things that everybody relies on. You know, you're hearing an awful lot of rhetoric here, and I'm very impressed with the people that have joined me here, but I'm not impressed with the rhetoric. You hear it every time. And what I want to tell you is it boils down to one thing, personal representation. I can guarantee you this. I founded the largest accountability organization in Canada in 1994. I have a proven track record. I believe that we need to make absolutely sure that the things that are pledged here today are carried out. I will be that one to meet with you and carry it out. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, just to uh, make this run a little smoother, if you could just wait for me to call you for rebuttal, so that way, because I know there's a lot of interested candidates who wish to rebut, and we're only in room four. So the next person who's indicated um, is uh, John Jamel, independent. The problem is that everybody borrows new liquidity from the Bank of Canada or from a bank, call it a pump house, and dump it in the pool. And now they dump the principal in the pool and they got to try and come back with the principal plus the interest. No amount of splashing the funds in the pool is going to solve your problem in the pump house. There's an imbalance in the pump house. We owe more than we get. We can never pay it. So no amount of splashing in the pool is going to help solve the imbalance in the pump house. Okay, final rebuttal, Libertarian Party of Canada, Keith D. Kumar. So, I, I understand what you're saying, that you know you want to keep the taxes there, but really, if, if you're going to cut taxes, where are you going to get that money from? It's not going to be from the programs that are, that are valuable to people. You're going to get it from, well, be responsible and, 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 and educating about what the government is doing right now. There's, there's so much redundancy and waste in the government, it is ridiculous. How about we audit? How about we go in there and we find out where that money is being spent and, and, and run that as, as, a, as a better business? Because right now it's just it's ridiculous what they're doing with their currency and our money. And we can stop subsidizing oil companies. Okay, we're going to move to the next. Uh, we've had four rebuttals for this question, so I'll provide opportunities for the candidates if they wish to rebut the next series of questions. Okay? I'll do my best. I, I know the audience will remind me. So, so the next question, the topic is health care, and we'll start with the Progressive Canadian Party candidate, Dorian Baxter, and move the, in the same direction. Now just in case I run out of time, it's all in my flight, yeah? Okay, I'm going to start with the question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, that's okay. We're, we're easy peasy tonight, especially with me. So, first time, first time moderating, so I'm good. Okay, with discussions about privatization of healthcare taking place at the same time as proposals being put forward for universal pharmacare programs, it appears that the future of healthcare in Canada is at a crossroads. What is your position on the provision of universal healthcare in Canada, and why is it such a timely issue for residents of York Simcoe and Canadians at large? <laughs> okay, uh, you know, really and truly, I would have to say that the jewel in the Canadian belt is our healthcare program. We are the envy of the world, and why is that? It's because we have one level of healthcare. We have to make sure that we look after that. We have to support the Canadian Charter of Health Freedom, especially with regard to naturopathic products as well. We can't let the pharmaceuticals run the show. It's money, money, money. But I will say this, that if you stop and think about what is the most important issue in your life today, it has to be your health. We have to get back to what we had in the 1970s and 80s, where there was real health care, and there was absolutely very little weight lines. I think one of the most important things is to take what the federal government has done, they've downloaded it to the provinces, We've got to hold them accountable. They've got lots of money for health care. They've shoved it down the throats of the provinces. I will be the squeaky wheel to prevent that. Thank you very much. I, I see 
not an office in a bag. I think that the federal government should get out of health care and leave it to the provinces and let the provinces deal with that. I believe that having two tiers of systems looking after the system causes the problem. You have so much administration costs right now. Health care is at about 42% of the administration right now. And that is, like, I've, I've never seen a business that flourishes when there's 42% administration. So if, if we have a $290 billion health care system, and $130 billion goes to administering that, that's a huge problem. That's, that's what we have to fix. We have to, we have to stop the redundancies. We have to put the money at the bottom end of this. It, the reason it's a timely issue is because it's a long, straight line, and nobody's getting proper care. And then to call it universal health care is kind of a misnomer because we don't look after optical or dental or, or anything. It's not universal health care. It's, it's critical care at best. So we need to address these, these questions. <laughs> okay, presuming we don't use the Bank of Canada. Here's how Argentina did it. Six provinces in 1985, when they were going broke and they were going to lay off all their workers, the healthcare workers too said, no layoffs. We will accept small denomination government bonds in our pay if we can use it for hydro, taxes, medical, and licenses. And six provinces started paying all their employees with provincial bonds as currency. And guess what? Within a few years, they paid off all their foreign debt. Now, you didn't hear about that, right? Doesn't make the news when someone prints up their own currency and gets out of debt. But Argentina did it. So, I call it the Argentine solution. We could do it too. So, it's all, not always bring down the cost of health care. We could bring up the cash in people's pockets too. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to say that uh, the Green Party was actually the first party back in 2015 to actually have Universal Pharmacare out on their platform. And I'm very thankful for the other parties that have actually come and got uh, their speed up to the party. So uh, Universal Pharmacare is not a, a huge part of the Green Party. But I'd like to say that we don't need to be cutting or privatizing healthcare. We need to be increasing funding to healthcare. We need to be working on solutions for preventative healthcare rather than reactive healthcare. You can spend a lot less money if you're spending money up front to prevent an issue from happening rather than dealing with disastrous results after the fact. Where does privatization end? Privatize healthcare, privatize education. Soon we're going to be privatizing fire services and police services. It doesn't work. Only the rich get to have those uh, solutions. We need to be able to work on an inclusive environment for everybody. That's what the Green Party stands for. Thank you. Unless we're all rich. Do you really want another that's where this is headed. We've already got two-tier health care. We have to live with that fact. Quebec is doing it and pursuing it in an aggressive manner so that basically they can deal with it up front. The reality is it's a provincial domain. I saw a lot of people shaking their heads when they're saying, oh, well, we've got to get the feds out of it. You know, if I was to ask you, who are you going to hold responsible when health care collapses? Are you going to point at the feds or the province? Because they're going to be pointing at each other. So the libertarian is actually correct. The federal government needs to get out of it so that you can hold the province accountable. 50% of the provincial budget right now goes to health care. You need to hold them accountable and say, listen, is this enough privatization? Is it too much privatization? But as long as you keep pointing it back and forth to the feds, you are basically going to invite all of these candidates to lie to you. Oh, sure, we'll give you some more money. And then we claw it back afterwards. And you are left holding the bag. You, don't, you can't get your, your, cardi uh, your cardiac surgery. You can't get your cor uh, your cor We're cardiac surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Okay, for the National Citizens Alliance, our health care system is definitely the jewel for Canada. We don't want to see our health care fade into the background and, and become second class. However, we do support the limited private options to deal with the current backlogs and the gaps in the private sector, uh, the wait times in the public sector. Um, 
it's essential that the right now with our healthcare system, the wealthy can afford their healthcare. These are the people that we would like to shift out of the public domain and uh, place space back into uh, put space in for the average person. Thank you. So it's troubling to hear a lot of the candidates here supporting privatized health care, meaning uh, our health care will be based on the amount of wealth that we can accumulate. Uh, we know better than that. We're already leaving people behind with the system that we have. And the federal government most certainly has a role to play in this. We transfer the money to provinces, and we used to tell them how they could spend it. We can, again, have targeted transfers that tell our provinces explicitly you cannot have a two-tier system or you will not receive the funds that you need. We can't leave it up to the government of the day. We see what happens in Ontario when that happens. And the Conservatives are not here, but if they were, I can tell you that Andrew Scheer is currently advocating the Canada Health Act loosen the restrictions put on provinces so that you can get more forwards trying to privatize our health care. We need to stop that, and the privatization of our entire public sector has to stop, frankly. It's how we're losing control over well-paying jobs and the services that we so desperately need. Um, the Liberals might tell you they support uh, a, a public health care system, but it's chronic underfunding that even allows us to contemplate uh, looking for other solutions. I think it's very concerning that in the province is con even considering privatization. Um, it is about life and death. Sometimes it's not simply about getting an appointment. My twins, as I mentioned in my introduction, were born at 28 weeks. They were born three months early and they weighed a pound. If we didn't have a healthcare robust system, I don't know if they would be here today. And if I would certainly not be in my home. So it is a top priority for me. Just as right, the Conservatives are not going to be standing up to Ford if he comes for health care. But know that this is a top priority for me. I won't allow that to happen. I will advocate as hard as I can in Ottawa to make sure that we have a healthy health care system federally and provincially. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you can just indicate a show of hand if you wish to rebut, and I'll just try to make sure that I will take this uh, um, as fairly as possible. So we'll start with the uh, Libertarian Party of Canada candidate, Keith Dean Kumar. So what we have right now, and I, I want to kind of just break it down for you. The federal government has $100 to hand out. So they take $20 of that for administration. They have $80 left. They offer that to the provinces. The provinces have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get that money. So they have to spend $100 to get that $80. You've now lost $40 of your original investment from that $200 off the top. The money is, is going into the administration of these, of these programs. We need to streamline them. We need to, to fix these problems. And I'll tell you, I, I, I made this quote a few years back, and it's not as popular in Canada as, as it should be. Socialism doesn't show up in our grocery stores in Canada. It shows up in our hospitals and our doctor's offices. If you want to talk life or death, nine month wait times for MRIs, long lines, people dying waiters, that's a problem. That's something we have to look at. Green Party of Canada candidate, Matthew Lund. So, to my libertarian friend here, I'd like to say yes, you are correct in the fact that maybe we are spending a little bit too much in administrative costs. But, yes, we can cut the administrative costs and actually have an implemented plan that comes from Ottawa that says this is how you're going to get that money and this is how you're going to spend it. We need to be spending it on doctors, nurses, medication, pharmacare, and beds, not on administrative staff. So we do need to fix the problem, but we need to increase oversight into the problem. So that we're spending $10,000 to fix a problem before it becomes a problem, rather than spending $100,000 after it's become a crisis and a catastrophe. No other rebuttals? Okay, we'll go to the uh, next question. Uh, the topic is housing, and the Libertarian Party of Canada, Keith Dinkmar, will start. What is your party's plan to address the rising costs of housing, 
the lack of affordable housing, and in turn, the growing crisis of homelessness across Canada. Oh, okay, so regulation is what stops homes from being built, and the cost, and that's what drives the price straight through the, the, the over-regulating of the industry. Um, we should be allowing people to rent out basements. We shouldn't be regulating them to the nth degree to do this. We need to get out of that way. We also need to fix our currency, of course. That's a big issue for me, is, is fixing our money. That will uh, help keep the costs down. But uh, we, what happens is, is you, you need to be building these, you need to be allowing municipalities to be building micro homes for people who, who are less advantaged. I don't see anywhere where we're doing this. 200 square foot homes for the draft. For people who, who need to live in these. So we need to be thinking outside the box on these issues. But really, it comes down to government regulation. If you got the government out of the way, the free market can solve a lot of these problems. And that's, that's really what we need to do, is we back up and let the people solve these issues instead of having them regulate it. If you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. I was a professional gambler, 42 years. I was known as the professor at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City as I was the teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics and gambling course. So if anyone has a right to make a living gambling, it's me. Now, when you explain it to people in chips, it seems easier, though they'll have forgotten by the next day. But imagine that the bank in Canada, we use their chips to pay people to build new housing. And as fast as you build new housing, we give you new chips. Now you're gonna spend those chips and those people are going to end up with those chips. And they're going to come back and they're going to buy the housing. But they don't have to pay any interest on the housing. Just the depreciation. So when you're only paying for depreciation and repair, it's so easily affordable without the banker's share. As uh, Ontario's uh, first green MPP would say, Mike Schreiner, he would say, we need to skate where the puck is going. So in this case, we need to actually look at how to actually fix the root cause of the problem. So one of the things that uh, the Green Party has advocated for, the company that's based out of uh, Barry that uh, basically helps people with housing issues. And it's uh, based off of an economic model of downsizing your living accommodations. Um, it's a great company, it's called Solterra, and again, it's one that I definitely think that it needs to have a lot more uh, regulations put, uh, well, not put against it, but uh, basically we need to remove regulations from banks on mortgages that make it difficult for first-time home buyers. We need to actually have uh, a system where people can afford to buy a home without having to spend, you know, $80,000 up front. So that's uh, one of the big things I think with, we have to avoid band-aid solutions. Because each party just tends to look for the bigger band-aid. It never fixes the root cause of the problem. Thank you. They're coming after your house now. This housing problem is only going to get worse. Okay? If they take the profits from your house when you sell them now, where, where are you going to go? How are you going to move from one house to the next? The solution is that we take away the capital gains uh, tax, and so that people can buy houses as an investment and then rent them out. You can rent them to your neighbor. The solution is with you, not with the government. Don't believe the politicians who are going to tell you when, when they're about to take the profit of your own house right now that they're going to solve the housing problem. Government doesn't solve the problem. The genius of the people solves the problem. Let's free up capital gains, and then we can all start creating our own rental spaces for our neighbors. Yes, for the National Citizens Alliance, um, in terms of the housing problem, again, like my partner here, we would like to eliminate the capital gains uh, as well. Uh, housing is a very complex issue, and we believe, again, that it's a free market decision. If the people are able to afford their homes through uh, the lowering of taxation, they're going to have more money in their pocket. Subsequently, uh, even though the price of everything is going up, there's more money to go around. It's in their pocket. They're going to be able to afford the increased rents and the increased prices on housing. Thank you. What a huge 
disconnect from what's actually happening. Okay, we're talking about homeowners and capital gains. We have people in Bradford getting priced out of the most modest apartments you can imagine. That is a real crisis. We have a million homeless people in a, in a country as rich as ours. And to even suggest to leave it to the free market or to people, which is essentially leaving it to the market, you are then going to make more people homeless. The government needs to intervene here. Housing is a human right. It isn't something that can be left up to developers. There's no incentives right now for developers to build affordable housing. Why would they, right? But housing isn't meant for profit. It's shelter. It's essential to get all the other human rights that we take for granted. And the government needs to step in. We need to start building cooperative housing again. That's something the Liberals have not done and the Conservatives removed all the funding together. That is leaving people literally out in the cold. So yes, I know we all struggle with our mortgages. I know, I know. And there is a role to play, but really, let's think of the most vulnerable people that we know live in New York Simcoe. So I, I agree. I think as a community, as a society, we are all better off when people have stable, safe housing. The Liberal government has put together a national housing strategy as well as a poverty reduction strategy. And part of that is an effort to reduce homelessness over the next 10 years, chronic homelessness, by over 50% because we do need to make sure that those that are most vulnerable do have a safe, stable place um, in which to call home. Right here in Georgina, there has been over $800,000 put into the <coughs> affordable housing units here for necessary renovations and units that would take people right here in our community to make sure that they have a, um, a safe and stable place in which to live. But of course, there's always more that can be done. And so I'm listening to that, I'm hearing these concerns at the door, and I'm making sure that that issue is of top concern when I take that issue to Ottawa to work alongside the federal government. Thank you. With the greatest of respect, I have to say that the Liberal government, back to the days of Chrétien, has had the National Housing Plan underway. Nothing is happening. They are not achieving anything like the goals that they set for themselves under Chrétien. And when you ask them why, you get a shrug of the shoulders. My son-in-law, who works out in uh, Nanaimo, is building tiny houses. And I like what was said here by my colleague. We need to start funding immediately. And I like what was said here. It's, it's a crisis. We've got to get these tiny homes. He is able to produce them for about $20,000 and his, his workers who work with him have got everything, and they could be brought in right away. So that's one thing. But the other thing that I'm very concerned about is charity begins at home. I can't believe Trudeau, who is a globalist, is not interested in, in, in protecting our borders. We need to grant asylum to those that need it, but we don't need every Tom, Dick, and Harry come in here, and I will speak out. We need to look after our Canadians first. Thank you very much. Rebuttal. We'll start with the candidate from the New Democratic Party, Jessica McQueen. Okay, my rebuttal was going to talk about housing, but uh, let's not go to scapegoating. You all know that we do need every Tom, Dick, and Harry because that's where we all came from. We are all immigrants here, and they are not a threat to our safety. They are stimulus to our economy. To spend my time defending immigrants is just maddening. We were talking about housing, let's remember that. So quickly, the Liberals talk a lot of strategies. They did so in 2015. They made a lot of big promises. If you check their website now, all those initiatives now say, uh, what is the quote? Uh, not being pursued. So keep that in mind when we hear all these promises. Thank you. Independent John Trump. So vote for someone struggling with their mortgage. Did you know mortgage comes from the French words mort, meaning death, and gage, meaning gamble? Death, gamble? Everybody borrows 10, everybody owes 11. At the end of the game, someone is short and loses their house. So I want to make housing affordable rather than let people struggle with their death gambles. Progressive Canadian Party candidate, Tony Baxter. Just to not allow our dear NDP uh, candidate to get away with what she just said, I really have to say this, and I would ask her and all of us, 
How willing are we to open the front door of our house tonight and go down to Toronto and bring people in? It would be wonderful if we could do that. We cannot let every Tom, Dick and Harry in here because we, we have to. 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 It's very important to respect each other's point of views. I did come here 51 years ago. I did not come through the back door, as you probably did. His was nasty too. Has to be respectful. It's been good so far, folks. Let's keep it that way. Thank you. Final rebuttal from the uh, Liberal Party of Canada, Sean Tanaka. Somewhat speechless. Okay, so um, I did want to emphasize that the Liberal Party is delivering results right here in North Simcoe. I do agree, though, that there is more to do. Eight hundred thousand dollars probably is 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 a good start, but it's not the end. We need to make sure that we we send a strong progressive voice that can work alongside the government and champion this particular issue. And 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 we are talking about housing and the most vulnerable and making sure that seniors aren't priced out of the communities that they've given so much to. So to bring it back to housing, yes, there's more to be done, but the Liberals have been made a commitment to here to York Simcoe, and I want to continue that conversation in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to, we've had four rebuttals, sorry. If you put your hand up for the next one, I'll call you for sure, because we haven't rebutted yet. Um, okay, the next topic is climate change and the environment, and we're going to start with independent candidate John Trammell. I'll read the question. Climate change and the role we will play in the protection of the environment is, in the opinion of many, the critical issue of our time. What plans does your party have to address climate change while balancing this with the need to grow our economy? Well, put it on your resume. I tried to stop the climate from changing. Can you imagine anything more stupid than trying to stop the climate from changing? Now, when you wanted to stop global warming, that had a direction. That made sense. But 20 years ago, when global warming stopped, they used the trick to hide the decline. And now they changed the name to climate change. You think it still means global warming, but it stopped. So, when I found out that they lied to us, and that they hid data from us, I said, hey, these guys are scamming us for some reason. I'm not going to believe that warming is global until we're warmer than when Greenland was green 800 years ago. And when you see everybody saying, oh, it's definitely man-made, we're causing the warmest years in history, we're not. The medieval war period was way, way warmer than our little blip right now. And just because they didn't tell you the truth doesn't mean you can't go dig it up. I did. I'm not paying no taxes. So despite the fantasy, climate change actually is the defining issue of our economy. Order, please. Living in a livable planet for all and not just the 1%. So ask yourself seriously, what is the price of uh, doing nothing? Instead of subsidizing, so what would we do? Instead of subsidizing oil companies, instead of you know, help heavily uh, giving tax subsidies to uh, tax shift on emissions, uh, we, have, we have to work on the clean energy jobs. There's a $7 trillion economy on shifting to clean energy. We're transitioning e uh, evenly to clean energy. We have the opportunity to produce huge amounts of clean energy. Solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, instead of the very dirty energy of fossil fuels. The dirty thing is the cheaper thing to do, and while it might seem like a better deal in the short term, market failure happens when you can't externalize your cause. Thank you. They want to give us the carbon tax. The carbon tax is a job killer. The carbon tax will not be tolerated under the People's Party in Canada. The solution, first of all, climate change is real, all right? But the, while 
Canada's uh, contribution to climate change is 1.6 percent globally. If we allow them to tax us further, so that they can, so that we can make a dent on our 1.6, all we're doing is really subsidizing the billionaires in China who are burning coal. 1.6 percent. We are a tiny uh, portion of what the world is facing right now. Right now, car, um, climate change is something that needs to be addressed through innovation. Let the private sector, by getting rid of the capital gains, come up with the solution for clean air, windmills, whatever, whatever the solution may end up being. Don't trust the government to tax you, and then they'll redistribute it. Well, one of the things the National Citizens Alliance is uh, we're very proud of our climate change uh, policy. But there's no dispute that uh, climate change does a, a exist. Uh, what is disputed, however, is the model that is predicting the climate change. The United Nations models are exaggerated, and we believe that the Russian model has been far more accurate. Over the last 60 years, Canada's average temperature has increased by 1.5 degrees Celsius. The detected changes in the air temperature, uh, there are, sorry, excuse me, rather, there are detected changes in the air temperature, the precipitation, the snow, and the ice cover. Canada is simply becoming wetter every year. Uh, there are rapid declines in the Arctic Sea uh, in, in both the summer and the winter. One of the things, or sorry, rather, we do have quite a comprehensive list. The NCA does support education on lifestyle to reduce uh, the overall footprint that we are making uh, to the world as a whole. We do support economic development uh, and, and the prosperity to create cash and research to deal, uh, to deal with the emissions. Uh, we want to improve... Sorry, your time's up. Oh, that was fast. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we'll say we reject our time. Thank you. Okay, I think it's clear that uh, in terms of climate change, we're lacking in real leadership on this issue. Uh, and when you need to lead in with, I believe in climate change, uh, basically what follows is, but I don't have a plan to do anything about it. All the talk about carbon tax and whether it's a job killer, whether we can afford it, it's just a distraction from what we really need to do. And that's a bold transition away from fossil fuels. We know that's a dying industry, and we have poured far too much of our tax dollars into that dirty industry to begin with. We need to stop. We need to stop overspending for pipelines, and we need to transition to green, clean jobs that can go right across the country. They're not going to be uh, predominantly in Alberta, but we can't leave Alberta workers behind either. It's not their fault that the government has just poured all of their investments into this industry. They need to be supported and retrained so that we can have a thriving economy based on a stable resource like the sun, like everything the Green Party mentioned. All of those things aren't as volatile as oil. It makes good business sense. Uh, thank you. So the time to act is now, right? We aren't prepared to kick this issue down the road and leave it for future generations to deal with. I grew up in this riding. I want to make sure that we have a healthy, clean environment and lake um, for both our children and our grandchildren. And it's the Liberal Party who has a plan to protect the environment and grow the economy. We're putting a price on pollution because when pricing, when pollution is free, there's more pollution. But the pricing on pollution plan that we have in place will put more money back into the pockets of 8 out of 10 families. And how we're able to do that is that we are giving that rebate to families um, up front so they can adjust to this new reality and, and make different um, choices. We're also making sure that in areas like York Simcoe, there's a 10% top up because the reality is that we don't have some of the, the public transportation um, access, uh, accessibility that we have in, in Toronto. Um, oh, well, thank you. You know, there is an old saying, the heart may conceive and the head devise in vain if the hand be not prompt to execute the design. And I have to say, this is a time for action. One of my concerns is, you know, many of you are aware that for actually uh, 10 years, there has been the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Nothing's been done about it. That was, that was released 10 years ago. 
I really believe we do need a carbon tax, so I disagree with some of the colleagues here, but I believe it has to be a well-reasoned carbon tax. It has to be a carbon tax based on the findings of the old Kyoto uh, Protocol and the Paris Accord. But we cannot just immediately get rid of the things that have got us to where we are. And I think if you look at the windmills today, if you look at the solar panel design and production, I am utterly convinced, and I say without evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation of any kind, we can experience a green employment boom. Thank you very much. Well, first off, there is a huge difference between carbon and pollution. Carbon is an element. It's, it's not pollution. Pollution is a totally different thing. Can everybody hear? I just want to make sure. No, you need can to you, can you Sorry, I'll, I'll take the mic though. Right on this side is better. So. Yeah. Go around, Thank you. Uh, so there's a huge difference between carbon and pollution. Uh, pollution is pollution, carbon is an element, it's, it's not a pollution. But let's let's talk about the issue here and, and, and if we're going to hold people accountable, let, let's actually hold businesses accountable for them. We have a criminal law system, we can do that. Let's hold countries accountable that are actually polluting this world. We're, we're carbon neutral in this country, we're, we're, we're very good at that kind of stuff here. So let's, let's influence countries like China and India who actually are really bad for these things and then let's use our trade policies to influence that but at the end of the day let's let's separate the two carbon is something and pollution is something completely different and let's hold businesses accountable that are polluting our environment okay. thank you we're gonna rebuttal we'll start with uh, the green party candidate Canada candidate Matthew Lund. okay so you're right there is a difference between carbon and pollution, and the Green Party stands for pollution pricing, not carbon tax. But having said that, I'm sitting here listening to all of the my fellow candidates try to fear monger on the carbon tax, and quite frankly, it's it's malarkey. Uh, BC has a carbon tax, and the economy in BC is healthy. In 2008, the province implemented North America's first broad-based carbon tax, proving that it is possible to reduce emissions while growing the economy. Between 2007 and 2015. Provincial GDP grew more than 17% while net emissions declined by 5%. So are you saying that Ontarians are not as smart as BC people? Sorry, time's up. <laughs> That's exactly our oh, point. Oh, uh, you just have to wait. But since you didn't get it last time, I'll, I'll give it to you now. People's Party of Canada, 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 Rubber Goat, Roots. That's exactly our point. BC did it and they did it right. If he's right, and I don't know, let's go with it. But that's exactly what we should do. Let the province then, not the feds. The feds, why should the, the federal government be trusted anymore? They're, they're already taxing us and, and coming after our houses now. Do you really believe in this rebate stuff where they could claw it back at any time? That's ridiculous. He's absolutely right. If BC is the solution, then let Ontario follow that solution. But not the feds. The feds just want to get into everything, tax us as much as they can, and okay. then deny us later. Time's up. Uh, New Democratic Party candidate, Justin McQueen. Okay, so again, we keep going back to the tax, uh, the carbon taxes, though that's the be all end all to, to stopping climate change. And so what you are hearing right across the board is zero plan. To move away from fossil fuels. Whether they have it or not, we're not hearing it, and they're just bickering over the carbon tax. And in terms of rebates, uh, throwing money at the issue over and over again is also not the solution. I mean, we give $3 billion a year to fossil fuel companies in subsidies, while our Prime Minister says he's a champion of the environment. So uh, whatever we're doing right now is not working. I don't know if two of the candidates want to address, but I'll, uh, I'll uh, the independent candidate, John Tremell, has had the promo. Well, still fooled by trick to hide decline, but still they lead the way. I tried to stop climate from changing on their resume. Well, I have the same education as Mr. Spock. Systems engineering, applied science, and mathematics and gambling. I can figure out the winningest way to go. Which is why I'll bet a hundred bucks that I'm right and they're wrong. Next year is going to be colder than 1998 and colder than the dirty 30s. I bet a hundred anybody wants to take it. So, I'm just, so. Okay. 
I'm sorry, we're only going to allow for four rebuttals. I apologize. Um, you'll have an opportunity at the end of the debate to share your thoughts with, uh, with the audience. Let's give a hand to our wonderful moderator here today. Um, I wanted to just say to people, we have one more question left, uh, but we want you to start thinking to yourselves what you might want to ask the candidates. Uh, you can ask them individually, you can ask all of them the same question, we'll, we have different time limits for those things. Uh, if you don't feel like asking a question that you want us to ask for you, come to the back, we have little sticky notes, you can write your question down. So think about that now for the next 10 minutes while the next question is asked and answered. Thanks very much. Okay, final question. Before we get to the audience question, it's about our youth. And we'll start with the uh, independent candidate, uh, John Chamel. And I'll read the question. The young people in the York Simcoe riding, including our Indigenous youth, have substantial concerns for their future with respect to all of the above, including jobs, affordability, the environment, and the quality of life. Why should they put their trust in your party to provide them with the most viable and hopeful future? Because I can come up with the cash to give them paychecks. If you YouTube for Termel and for Boss Bucks, you'll see videos of me asking a hundred different students Hey, would you work for six bus tickets an hour? Would you shovel the snow for six? Would you clean the park for six bus tickets an hour? Twelve bus credits an hour? All oh, but one said, sure. So imagine, we could be using unused bus capacity to pay unemployed kids to do stuff for us. Now, don't tell me that isn't the smartest idea you ever heard in your lives. Right? Low <laughs> transit. The kids take the bus. Anyway, the point is, every major city, everybody, all the kids were sharp enough to get it. Maybe you got a kid who can explain it to you. But paying kids with bus tickets is a brilliant idea. Hong Kong did it. I pushed it into Brantford mayoral election in 2010. I didn't get in, and a year later, Hong Kong did it. Har har! They're brighter than we are. So Greens definitely want to invest in education for the future. Um, Greens build the future, not the past. There, as I said before, there's a six trillion dollar green clean energy economy. I want to just remind everybody of a very simple statistic. So for every million dollars that you invest in oil companies, it creates two jobs. For every million dollars that you invest in clean energy, it creates 15 jobs. So for this pipeline that was purchased, that job, that the price of that pipeline would have gone to create 70,000 clean energy jobs. We need to move away from the oil industry. We need to move towards clean energy. It's simple mathematics, and it is what is going to be for the future. That is what we need to escape towards. Thank you. The millennials are our future. But what have we done to them? We've got a $19 billion deficit. We're heading towards a $1 trillion debt. If we, if, if we ask them to trust us when they have lied, when the federal government has lied to them over and over again, I, I can't imagine why they would, 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 would support us. The truth is we need to simply say, look, guys, you're brilliant, we know you're brilliant, we're going to try and get out of your way. And, and through a creative solution revolution, which is what uh, Maxime Bernier is supporting, he wants the people to come up with their own solutions. If we let the genius of the millennials go and get out of their way, they'll find a way to prove both create jobs for themselves and uh, others as well. But uh, relying on, on governments that have portrayed and lied and built their whole reputation on those lies and left them uh, uh, short for cash with respect to the deficit and the debt, and then asking for more taxes, that's just not going to work. That's not going to save the millennials. <coughs> Thank you. With the National Citizens Alliance uh, plan here, uh, education is extremely important for all our students. We 
definitely are examining the university and the college tuition issues. Uh, it's simply too expensive to go to school. Uh, we would definitely look to re uh, remove those barriers for our youth. Uh, if they're not getting the degrees that they need, they're not going to be good for us for the future. As well, uh, we are going to ensure that um, uh, we partner with the provinces to make sure that the uh, student loans and grants are given uh, to uh, at the post-secondary schools at a much lower cost. In terms of our military policy as well, uh, we, we would like to see incentivize, uh, sorry, in, incentivize the military service for the Canadians between the age of 18 to 21. And upon their entry into the military, we would actually incentivize a lot of their tuition, uh, both at the university and the college level. Thank you. So part of that question was why the youth should trust me, you know, with their futures. And we have seen politics for a long time. It's, it's a lot of doom and gloom, so I don't actually expect them to trust me with their future. But trust that you actually do hold the power and you can should be able to work with your government to get what you need. And right now, the current representation that we have completely shuts out youth. It shuts out most of us. And it's, so it's no wonder that they have the lowest voter turnout. We have to give them hope through our good leadership. And um, I have, I'm on the record, I have been there fighting against these OSAP cuts. We need free tuition for our kids. We don't need studies to talk about it. Kids do not need to pay to get educated. We benefit as a society, we know this. And we know students leaving university with incredible debts is a detriment to our society. But how we fight or help youth is how we fight every, help everybody else, right? We bring everybody up. We increase wages. We lower the cost of living. We, we decrease inequality right across the board. That helps seniors. That helps students. That helps small businesses. I mean, it's the plan right, right across the board. So, thank you. So as somebody who's raising uh, two young boys and uh, as a university professor at Queen's University, City and the University of Toronto for almost 10 years now. I know firsthand listening to students how that can be and it's difficult sometimes mentoring students and knowing that the job um, prospects are somewhat precarious but that's why I'm running under the liberal, liberal banner is that I do believe that we are making inroads in terms of job creation. Almost 900,000 jobs have been created since 2015. We have the lowest unemployment rate in over 40 years. And what we're also doing is making sure that we do guide students by having Canadian summer jobs programs, by having Canadian internships, by increasing um, Canadian grants for university students by over 50%. But of course there's more to be done. But as a university professor, I want to be that voice. I think I can be that voice to advocate for the students that I've mentored at the university and help mentor them as I move forward, um, hopefully as the member of parliament for Nose and Co. Thank you. Well, I really can't believe this, but you know, uh, Jessa of the NDP party, when you finished your presentation, I had the hardest time staying in my seat. I wanted to leap up and give you a standing ovation. Because everything you said I have to subscribe to 110%. You know, I had written down here, young people, they need vision and hope. And you know, it's a very important thing. Even the Bible says very clearly, where there is no vision, the people perish. It is so important for us to stop these ridiculous student loans. We do need to have what I believe Government, federal government funding for those students, undergraduate students, who are not burdened down with these unbelievable um, debts. I, as an educator for 35 years in the, both the, the, the secondary panel and the, the elementary panel, am very concerned in this particular area for what is student-teacher ratio. And I see my time's up, but it's all in my flyer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, this is a libertarian conversation here, the difference between equity and opportunity and equity and outcome. Outcomes will never be equal. It, 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 it's based on your effort and what you're willing to put into it. And I, and I believe that you have the vision to succeed, but they've lost hope. And they've lost hope in our government because it's failed. 
And the solution, when, when government has failed you, why, why would the solution be government itself? You're asking for more issues. So fix the currency, remove regulations, give these, give these people an equal opportunity at the beginning and allow them to succeed instead of you know, promising them that it'll all be okay at the end of the day. You have to put in an effort, and they're willing to, if we get out of their way and allow them to do these things. Okay, rebuttal. We'll start with uh, Robert Gertz, People's Party of Canada. Imagine the courage it took for Maxime Bernier to not only break off, but at, while doing it, saying the Conservatives are morally and intellectually corrupt. He was burning as many bridges as he could in doing so. Why was he doing it? For the people. Now listen, we already know that Ford has uh, put a $300 million burden that he's withdrawing from the universities and he's going to, and, and, and saying, you guys figure it out, figure out how to make things uh, uh, balanced. So what, he, what's, what he's left out though, with respect to the intellectually and morally corrupt, is now the university are just going to download that onto the students. And so, bingo, the students get screwed again. Don't trust the government. Time so. Independent candidate, John Tremel. Well, I would tell the youth, 50 years ago, I got an interest-free loan from the government to pay for my education. Thank you, and I paid it back. But another good reason to vote for me is I'm the guy who's fighting legalized pot in the courts. That's me. I made him drop two, 4,000 charges in 2003. Me on Parliament Hill smoking a doobie and get arrested. But I didn't bring my kids. So, most people don't know that marijuana regrows brain cells. Neurogenesis. Brand new brain cells. Which explains why I'm so sharp and they're so dull. <laughs> Two other opportunities for rebuttal. Anybody wish to rebuttal? Okay. Well, that's it for five questions on our end here. So the audience, we have some questions, I believe. Okay. So we're allowing three questions. Same time frame. Good evening, I just have one question. Out of the eight candidates... I think it's off. That's off. Okay. Out of the eight candidates that are sitting at this table... Pull that up. Is there one candidate here that would actually speak to closing the immigration issue for a 10-year period and allow Canadian citizens to benefit from this country and close the borders to all the refugees that we're paying for right now. Do you want an answer from all the candidates? Any, any candidates. Well, maybe we'll have an answer from all the candidates, and we'll start with the Green Party of Canada, and we'll move in the same direction. I will say absolutely not, no. Um, for a few reasons. Number one, okay, you're worried about immigration as it sits today, okay? Now let me tell you, let me ask you a question. Are you worried about the uh, couple hundred thousand refugees that might come into the country now? Or are you worried more about maybe the billion climate refugees that we might experience over the next 10 years? There's going to be a huge uh, influx of, of refugees if we don't fix in, uh, climate right now. But uh, more to that, using immigration as a tool to divide us as Canadians and fear-mongering of saying that you know immigration causes problems is completely un-Canadian. It's neither either or. It's and, and they're not illegal. Uh, so the green solution is not to close uh, the border of refugees. That we're going to actually do our part, as any responsible country should. People we'll move along the same direction. If the does not wish to speak, then they can just pass it to the person next to them. We're going to go this same direction. Yeah, same direction. The People's Party in Canada, we're all we're all immigrants here, okay, and we're all the benefits of it. Parents were. Immigrants, I'm a first generation Canadian. Um, the bottom line is, is what can we afford? So the People's Party believes in immigration. We're going to reduce their immigration rates from 350 to 390, which the Liberals are proposing right now, to 250,000. All right, and we're going to make it based on basically what you can bring to the economy. 
So if someone's coming in, you may say, all right, what does your Simcoe need? And then we're going to try and provide that based on what will help the economy. And we are going to reduce it by $100,000 minimum. If, if it's going over uh, 350, we'll bring it down to 250. The National Citizens Alliance is actually very passionate on this subject. Um, obviously, I, I think if you've done any research on us, that is the uh, foundation of our uh, platform. Uh, while we're not in agreement to closing immigration, to answer your question, we are going to drop it significantly to 50,000 immigrants or less per year. But you could pretty much consider that a closed uh, border. Um, we're not against immigration. We don't think it is un-Canadian uh, to, to be able to say we have to look after Canadians first. We will take the immigration people, uh, immigrants that are coming in, and making sure that they are the highest quality <coughs> in Canada. They will be completely, completely vetted and integrated for a first class uh, world. And they will also be checked for radical ideologies, which we have seen in Canada is not working. Thank you. Okay, I'm really distressed over this question, as you can probably see. Okay, we are all immigrants. I said it before, you gotta own it, it's true. And if we're just talking from a business sense, that is the worst idea I've ever heard. If you understand economics, even in the smallest bit, you will understand that we rely on immigration to make our economy work. You tell Tell the farmers around here what will happen if you close our borders to the migrant workers that <laughs> grow our, most of our produce. And to, to simplify it, to even say Canadian values and talk about integration, who decides what a Canadian value is? My values different from your values, and your di values different from their values, and that's actually what's Canadian about us and what's human about us. And so when we hear these questions and we hear about the scapegoating uh, and talking about immigrants, this is, we've seen this before. We have seen that behavior before. We have seen scapegoating in World War II. We turned the Jews away because we wanted to make sure they were the right kind of immigrants. And we have a very dirty history of being very racist with our immigration policies. And that has to stop. And you need to reject this kind of ideology from the beginning. refugees and immigrants and closing <coughs> our borders. I'm a fourth generation Japanese Canadian and going to what Jessa had said, World War II was an ugly uh, time in Canadian history. And if we close the borders and we're developing this fear and suspicion and scapegoating, it turns to Canadians. My father was born interned, imprisoned in a World War II internment camp in British Columbia, in Canada. He spent the first four years of his life living in an internment camp because we turned on Canadians, because we grew this fear and suspicion of the other. And these were Canadian-born people. I was born here. My father was born here. My grandparents were born here. So I am very troubled by the comments that were here. Immigration and, and refugees and opening up our borders as being warm, welcoming people are what make us Canadian. And we offer that safe haven to not only um, Canadians that live here, but those that are seeking and fleeing persecution and war and terror. Thank you. I'm not really sure if anybody really listened to Mr. Paré's question. He didn't say he was advocating that. He said, I would like to know which candidates would be willing to do that. That didn't mean that he's telling that, that, he, that he wants that. He's just seeing where we come from. So, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, your emotional outburst there. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, really, it's a rush of judgment because he wasn't suggesting that. Now, let me say this. There is no doubt in my mind we need immigrants. And, of course, my colleague at the back there, you know, was suggesting that I got in, and I did, I got in 51 years ago, but I came through the front door, and it seems to me, you may be a Canadian, in which case, uh, 
I have to retract the comment I made. I apologise publicly. I was a little upset. So I hope I, you know, can maybe get your forgiveness for making that little terse remark. But I guess the big thing for me is, I'll be honest with you, I am really concerned that, for example, Sean just said, and it was Jessica, Jessica or Sean, we don't have Canadian values. Or, that's not true. We do have Canadian values, and we need to, to follow this. Thank you very much. We, we should bring in as many immigrants as we need, and we should allow as many people that, that need to come into the country that, that need to come. There, there should be no set number. It's not 50,000, it's not 2,000, it's not a million. It's how many people come to the border and that are acceptable to be in the country. What we need to do is we need to stop spending our money on foreign aid. We need to stop spending our money on foreign incursions. We need to focus that, that money locally and then keep the money here. So it's, it's not a question of how many immigrants are we going to allow, 5,000, 5, 5, we, we are an open country. But what we, what we can have is, is have an, an open immigration policy that allows a welfare state to, to occur on these people too. We need, we need to make sure that the, the people that we're bringing in this country are, are going to be viable and start working for the economy. And, and that's basically where I have with that one. Well, most of them are here because Canada supported the United States in blowing up their countries and in polluting their countries with uranium ammunition. They can't go back. It's poison. We have to help them clean it. So they're here to stay. And if you want to send them back, remember, they're coming for a war from a war zone, and they're a lot better at killing you than you are at killing them. Now, I don't fear that, because I give them an interest-free credit card and say, go find a job and get rich. And they all would. Just like every hood, every bum. You give an interest-free credit card, we get into the business and try and get rich instead of mugging you. So for the same reason, an interest-free credit card would calm the jitters of our thugs. It would calm the jitters of immigrants from overseas who know how to kill us better than we can kill them. Any rebuttal on Dorian Baxter? Yes, I just had a couple of things to add. You know, our party, the PC party, was led by Joe Clark with the Red Tories. And you know, we're the ones that have the honor and the privilege of bringing in the boat people. And I will tell you, with the greatest of respect to my colleague at the left here, and, and I appreciate where he's coming from when he says no more foreign aid, that is one of our strengths. You see, we are the people that really and truly care. And I love the fact that, you know, we are hopefully going to be returning to peacekeeping. I think in, with regard to our foreign policy, it needs to be made in Canada and not in the USA. Thank you very much. Any other rebuttals? Yeah. Adam, sir? Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to respond to both my uh, uh, liberal and NDP uh, candidates here. I'm sorry, I was born in Canada. I'm not an immigrant, okay? Quite frankly, uh, at the end of the day, the people who came here originally and founded this place, that's wonderful. Uh, I appreciate all the work they've done. But right now, um, my heritage is here. I started here. I didn't start off in my background of Germany or Hungary, okay? Uh, I want to know, just out of curiosity, how well the open border policy worked for Britain and France. Uh, you know, Sorry, time's yeah, up. Thank you. Justin McLean. Nobody cares where you were born. I don't care where any of you were born. We came to this country as families, and to, 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 to insinuate that people coming over now with maybe different colored skin have different motivations for their families, that's ridiculous. No, we are talking about, we're talking about the global south. You are talking about immigrants from the Middle East. You're talking about people from South America. That's predominantly who is making these refugee claims. But when we talk about how our families came over and worked so hard and built what they did, we're assuming that the migrants today are going to be different. And that rhetoric is based on racism, regardless of what the peanut gallery is going to harp at me. Remember that. what my, my uh, fellow candidate had said in, in, in terms
terms of his Canadian-ness. Um, as I said, I'm fourth generation Japanese Canadian. I was born here, my dad was born here, my, all my grandparents were born here. I might be the only person of color on a non-ticket panel, but I'm just as Canadian as all of you. Second question from the audience. I've got a question here that I'm going to ask from a member that wanted me to ask it on their behalf. So, and then we have one person who's indicated they're going to come up for the last question. Uh, so this question is for everyone. Um, we'll start here. Barbara Burns. Well, how long have you lived in the riding, and what groups have you been involved with? So that's to everyone, and it should be a quick one because it's not a long -term question. I don't live in the writing. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I took your mic. Why are you running your own Because actually, Bernie thought it was actually a gift to you, and I'll tell you why. I wrote a book. Let's use the microphone so everyone can hear. I, I, I think everybody can hear. No, no. Oh, yeah. louder. It's harder back here. Okay. I wrote a book for Tory Stafford. The lies. I'm working on it. Yes, it is. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. The, the liberals and conservatives have basically um, been lying to us all along. And that's why Maxine Bernie broke away. I wrote a book for Tory Stafford because the statistics for, um, for, for crime are, are basically suppressed or fraudulent. All right? So for example, they're saying the crime is down. It's not. You all know that there's a new crime out there and it's bigger than any other crime, and it's fraud. But they don't, but like, you try and go to a police station and report fraud. So the Time's reality up. is, I was parachuted in to get the message My out. Mistake. My mistake, because I was thinking I was in rebuttal mode. So, continue, because you've got another 10 seconds. My mistake. All right. Thank you. It's still working? No. All right, so the bottom line is this. Um, uh, for example, how many of you may be gun owners? If you are, I grew up in a house full of guns, okay? And, and you are the most responsible, decent people there is. But the problem is, every time there's a shooting in Toronto, every, the, all the politicians come out and say, we need gun reform. We don't need gun reform. Time's up. The, the bottom line is, there's a statistic that's been suppressed. Time's up, thank you. Thank you. I've, uh, I've actually lived in the riding for the better portion of my life. I've traveled uh, all across Canada. I uh, uh, have a place in Alberta. I also have a place in Northern British Columbia. I am here in Ontario as well. Uh, as a truck driver, I have the kind of the fringe benefit of getting around. Um, part of the question was what kind of organizations have I been involved with, primarily? Uh, my volunteer activities have gone to multiple multiple school races. Thank you. Okay. So my family and I moved to York Simcoe to Sutton about five years ago. We moved from the city. And really, I've been a community organizer since then. Uh, I was going to York University while I moved up here, and I was heavily active in uh, Amnesty International, as well as my student union groups. And here in York Region, I am the lead organizer for Fight for 15 and Fairness, which advocates for a higher minimum wage, paid sick days, and other key labor laws that we are lacking. And, and the reason I, I got super involved is because I met with Carolyn Mulrooney and Christine Elliott from Newmarket at Aurora, and we got no results, so I decided to replace that representation. Thank you. So I've lived in New York Simcoe for um, about, well, it has been 35 years now. Um, I grew up here. I'm raising my own family here. In terms of my involvement on a national level, I'm involved on the board of the National Association of Japanese Canadians. I'm also on the board of Diversity on Board, which is trying to get greater representation on agency boards and commissions for people of color, as well as the Matri Foundation, which deals with poverty reduction and social inequalities. And locally, I sit on the East Guillemary Public Library Board. I have for a few years. I also sit on the Sharon Temple Museum Society Board. 
Um, I also sit on the board for the Democracy Project, which is trying to create poverty reduction right here in York Simcoe with stakeholder partners of the United Way, um, York Region, and we're trying to make that actually more uh, robust in, in, in York Region. That's a new development that uh, a new board that I've uh, sat on that has just been kind of making legs in the past year. So um, a long history in York Simcoe. Thank you. I should point out that I currently live just below uh, Green Lane, which is the border. I'm living in Newmarket now, but I raised probably the greatest achievement of my life. I'm a single dad. I raised my two precious daughters entirely by myself since they were two and four. They both uh, grew up in, in Bradford, went to school there. And one of the reasons I'm running is a bit of payback because I love this area. So many great memories. Both my daughters. One of them went to Queen's, actually, and graduated with a master's degree, 98.2%, in social justice, women's rights globally, and third world equity. Both my girls, and my, my, my older daughter is out in Nanaimo, and she basically is dealing with reforestation. It's all in my little flyer there, but her other concern is wellness, and she actually is involved with Hollyhock, one of the largest wellness uh, places. What do you do? I'm, read my flyer. Read my flyer. So, yeah, and I, and I did point out that my two girls who were raised in Bradford, so in actual fact I had eight years in Bradford, wonderful time. I am uh, the Lions, Eagles, and uh, Shriners, and we deal with uh, helping bird, people with burn units. My church looks after Christmas hampers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, born in BC, moved to Ontario in 86. Uh, we moved up to the Keswick area around 1998. Uh, I lived in the riding here until 2003. As a bricklayer, I do follow work. I just moved back to the area about four months ago. Um, nothing active locally. Uh, I have done quite a few. Uh, I'm, I'm a champion for marriage equality, uh, cannabis rights. I've been at the forefront of both of those issues. But as of today, not a lot locally in the area, but I did just move back. So have, have, have a look for me. You'll see me around here a lot more. Okay, I'm from Brantford. I live three blocks away from the Brantford Casino. I don't spend much time in this riding, but I spend a lot of time in Port Perry and Casino Rama. So <laughs> go through once in a while. The reason I run in my 98th election, and I'm in the Guinness Book of Records for running in more elections than anyone else, is because of this Let's Time Bank software. It allows single parents to log on what nights they can double duty babysit each other's kids and then pay each other with one hour bills, even when they're broke. The Time Bank. You put in hours taking care of their kids, they'll put in hours taking care of yours. And I'm the producer of this software. So I run in all elections telling people I don't need to get elected. I just need someone with a brain to go get the software and do it yourself. And in 1996, exactly that happened. The headline super loser fails again, but the next month, Hamilton Self-Help Group starts up Hamilton Let's. Mission accomplished. So I run in every election to spread the word of how you can save yourselves. And if you're Time not interested, hey, your vote's going to prove it. Your kids are the ones 200 away from the bank. Thanks, <laughs> thank you. So my family's roots in this uh, riding go back five generations. Anybody that's uh, from the Bradford area or knows anybody in the Bradford area only needs to go back 20 years to know the name's Gordon and Doris Church because they were uh, heavily involved with the creation and, and the structure of uh, Bradford, helping build the, cur the curling club, the fire department, and uh, pr quite frankly, the Holland March. Um, so. Uh, myself, in terms of uh, different uh, organizations that I'm a part of, I'm a member of Barry Chamber of Commerce because that's where most of my business comes from. And uh, through that, I actually am an advocate towards the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a member of Business Networking International uh, as an uh, ambassador. Well, I'm actually on the path to becoming an ambassador for Business Networking International so that we can actually help advocate for business. I'm a member of the Simcoe County Young Professionals Association. and. Uh, what else? Uh, Georgian Bay Business Connections. I'm, a, I'm, I'm very heavily involved in a lot of small business organizations because small business is what I think is the central uh, focus of trying to actually boom our economy. Thank you. Yeah.
I'm not sure about who can rebut whether or not someone was in your sim go. But um, Robert Gertz, you, you seem to have, have your hand up, I'm not sure. I do, I do. Listen, imagine, this is a national election. The issues are national. An imaginary line is another form of identity politics. Right. Right. Okay, okay, yeah. The question was whether or not you live in New York City. I think everyone's. Uh, Everybody has a final minute to do yes. to say those things, okay? We have one so, last question over here. Yes. From the baby. <laughs> I swear he's not a prop at all. Um, so I'm one of the generation that um, is having a tough time getting by. Most of my income goes towards my uh, housing. And so with this whole guy, I'm going to have to. Uh, get daycare soon, and I know it's going to be $1,600 a month, uh, as well as I work shift work, so I can't actually uh, get anybody that could provide daycare during those times. So I know in 2015, the uh, national daycare program was sort of on the, on the heads of a couple of other parties, so what are any of these parties uh, looking to do for help? So we're going to start with the National Citizens uh, Alliance candidate answer. that everyone, men and women, can have their children taken 
care of, um, that it's affordable, and that they can join the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I must say that, um, what is that little guy's name at the back? Remy. Sorry? Remy. How do you spell that? R-E-M-Y. What a beautiful name. I, I, bless you. I want to tell you, do you like a little more? I want to tell you though that I, I identify 100% as a single dad living on 62 Hurt Street in Bradford on one salary. I would hate to tell you how much it costs on a monthly basis for you. As an educator, I got my school's papers in 1989. I was doing night, uh, night classes for the teachers to get their, their uh, credentials up, uh, teaching six university courses. And of course, I was lucky being a teacher because my daughters were off at the same time that I was off, and that was great. But you know, I am absolutely 100% for, I believe universal childcare is imperative. Our children are the future of Canada, they're the most, the most important uh, resource we have. And you know, as an educator studying at Toronto Teachers College in 1969, I remember reading Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. The first three years of life, a child learns more than 73.8 percent. Time's which, up. Which shows how important. So thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate it. So when I grew up, both my parents worked, and I stayed at my auntie Lois's house. She wasn't my aunt. She's a lady who looked after me, right? Um, she had six kids in her house. She had six kids were old and as one at a time as they grew up and they, they left the home, she took on another child and looked after them. That's been regulated out. You can no longer do that in, in a neighborhood anymore. So what I see is government causing a huge problem and then trying to solve it by throwing money at it. If you, if you want to subsidize childcare, stop charging parents tax on raising people's children. Get out of the way, allow people in the community to help you look after your children. I'm sure you have friends and family who can help you out with something like that. And, and, and just get government out of your way. That's, that's ultimately where we're at here is, is government causes a problem and then government offers a solution. And the solution is the community. The solution is not government. So, thank you. So everybody thinks you should be helped, for sure. And there's nothing they can do for you. Oh. Now, if you had to get up and go to set up your own do-it-yourself Red's time bank, well, at least you'd get a night off once in a while by double-duty babysitting with a next-door neighbor. But the mechanic might decide to take three hours per hour in his shop. And the dentist might decide to start to take six hours per hour in his chair. And you'd have a whole network of support grow around you if you started up a community currency. Because they all need babysitting hours. So, you can listen to them as they say they want to help you and they empathize with you and you really should be helped, but they can't do anything. They got no money. Or you can go print your own IOUs and pay the mechanic and the dentist with them and help yourself. So this issue does actually kind of hit home with me. Uh, I was actually working in a, a pretty decent law firm in downtown Toronto, commuting back and forth every day. And, uh, you know, then my wife had our newest baby, and we actually uh, did the math, and it was going to cost us close to $30,000 a year in uh, child care. We decided between the two kids that we have, and uh, we made a pretty conscious decision at that point that we were going to know I was going to quit my job in the city and I was going to take uh, uh, start my own business, work from home, so that I could actually be a stay-at-home dad at the same time, which I've done. Took a big financial hit in doing it, but it's been worth it you know, in terms of not having to pay that extra cost, which I know is a huge hit to a lot of uh, parents. So, yes, we do need to find a better solution. We do need to actually work to, uh, on trying to close that economic gap. And I, I want to go back to the point that I said, you know, if we were only taxing that 1%, that rich, the you know, same levels we were in 2009, the extra capital that we could actually gain as a country by taxing the rich properly would go to fund these programs that my friends the, uh, on the ultra right so vehemently disagree with. Thank you. have three politicians trying to solve the same problem, municipal, provincial, and federal, who are you going to hold accountable for that particular issue? The 
problem is that basically all three levels of government want to get in and say, oh, well, we're going to do this and help you out, and then they cheat you, and they, or they, they claw back. All right, we see it in healthcare, we see it in everything else. The People's Party simply wants to say, look, let's give the money back to the people, let's hold provinces accountable for everything that's provincially their jurisdiction, and we'll get out of the areas where we don't belong. And, and child care isn't an area that we belong. That's provincial. If, if, um, if Ms. Tanaka wants to make that her issue, let her run provincially, but not federally. Okay, rebuttal, um, Matthew Blunt. So, you know, by everything that I hear from, uh, from my friend here, it sounds like he just wants to basically strip down the federal government to its leanest possible way, and I, and I understand that. So basically, he's going to take all the federal authority out of everything so that he can spend his retirement playing canasta and taking tax dollars, is what I'm understanding. Okay, no, from the federal level, there needs to be oversight on how things get administered to the provincial level. It's a simple matter of administration. We need to actually have uh, a federal oversight so that things are administered properly to the provincial, then to the municipal. It starts at the top, and that's called accountability. Thank you. Uh, policeman of Order, Sean Tanaka. Now that my coughing fit is over, to clarify, it's not what we are going to do, it's what we are doing, and it is a federal issue and not a provincial issue with the Canada Child Benefit. As I said, 20,000 children here in New York Simcoe get that benefit. It was a benefit that the Conservative Party voted against. What I'm suggesting is that we need to make sure that we're advocating for families here in New York Simcoe because more depend on it than most ridings. I want to make sure that they still get that, that families feel supported. And no, I don't think it's enough. I do think that there's more that we can do, but I do think that that's a good start, and I do want to advocate that issue because as a mom, I see it as a priority. Thank you. sir. My green colleague here, uh, Steve. Um, first of all, I like how you slept that in. Ultra right, okay? We're not, I'm not ultra right, okay? This whole idea of left right get to me has got to come to an end. We are, uh, National Citizens Alliance will implement policies that are in the national interest of Canadians. It could be a policy that's similar to an NDP, it could be a policy that's similar to a conservative, or it could even be a policy that's similar to yourself. Um, stripping down all the essential services is not always the answer. And I've already proven we have a Time's up. kids plan. Thank you. There's room for one more rebuttal. You can pass that up. <laughs> and the final rebuttal of the evening. show up today, so uh, they can have the rebuttal, and I know sometimes yeah, I hear some chuckling when the Libertarian tells us that we're all just going to figure it out ourselves. Uh, that is the conservative ideology, right? They strip back all of our services, they leave us to the market that they don't plan on controlling whatsoever, and it's up to ourselves to pull up our bootstraps and just get hard to work, even though there's, you know, more people than there are jobs, and, you know, that's our reality. So don't let Scott's absence uh, let you from ri ridiculing their policies that essentially do tell you to figure it out for yourself. So that's it for the debate. Um, right now, we're going to give every candidate an opportunity to provide the audience with a closing remark. You have one minute, and we're going to start with Jessa McLean, New Democratic Party. We've heard uh, at least what everybody thinks. We didn't hear a whole lot of solutions, right? Uh, a lot of rhetoric that goes back and forth, but nothing that's really concrete that you guys can really hang on to. But I did. I mean, we talked about building affordable units, half a million cooperative homes, 
providing pharmacare to finally round out our universal health care, right? What's the point of getting you a doctor's appointment if you can't get the prescription that he's ordered? You know, I'm running for people like Beth, who I see at their front door, and they tell me two of their family members, they get sick, they need daily medications, now she can't afford her home. This is the reality in our communities, and it's not going to be solved by like, getting rid of capital tax gains or continuing to advocate for big business. And don't let people run on broken promises anymore. 2015, we all were liberal uh, as a nation, and where did it bring us? So we're still waiting for pharmacare, we're still waiting for a national health, uh, health strategy, we're still waiting for proportional representation that will make all of our votes count. All of these were broken promises, we cannot rely on them. I want to thank the organizers for putting on this debate. It is our last debate. I want to thank all of you for coming with your concerns and your issues. And that's why I'm knocking on doors every single day. That's why I'm getting out there. Because it's not about us as individuals. It's about your concerns and your issues being brought to Ottawa. And so I want to be that progressive voice that is able to work alongside the federal government and bring those concerns. In 2015, I ran, and I increased the Liberal voter turnout by 400%. We came as close as anyone has in taking out a Conservative stronghold, and we haven't taken our foot off the pedal. We are out there every single day and pushing harder than ever, because I think this is our time. We don't have an incumbent in this riding. You have a real choice that you can make a progressive um, member of parliament your representative here in York Simcoe, and I would love your support on February 25th, so vote Liberal, vote Shantanaka. Thank you. I would really appreciate you considering Dorian Baxter to go to parliament. It's interesting because the etymology of the word parliament is derived from the French word parler, to talk. And I guarantee you I can be a very, very strong voice. I want you to know that in terms of the economics, I'm the only candidate that is offering to return half my salary immediately to fight poverty and to establish programs in that area. I will also tell you that that means you'll be getting four candidates for the price of one. I am, as I mentioned earlier, with a few seconds left here, I am a blue liberal a red Tory, greater than the Greens, and our socially left progressive wing is actually far better than anything that the NDP can offer. We can run circles around their attacks on symptoms we plan to do the causes. Dorian Baxter to Ottawa, you will not regret it, and I'll say thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and I know you're not going to vote for it. So when your kids end up sleeping in the car, I just want you, and when you end up shoveling your own snow, I want you to remember me laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so after 40 years of liberal and conservative governments, they've left us with a declining middle class, students buried under crushing debt, the climate on the brink of collapse, and a social safety net that is in shambles. There is not time left for incremental change. Every environmental scientist is saying, 10 to 12 years if we are lucky. Our youth need answers now. Our workers need to make a livable wage. Our healthcare and our education systems need to be built back up. And the uncontrolled greed uh, and interference of the 1% needs to be brought under control. We are the only party willing to have our budget reviewed by a parliamentary budget officer for approval before we are elected. We're the only party for the environment. This is a time for change. This is a time when you can go out and instead of voting for a party or voting for a prime minister, you can vote for somebody to represent you. You vote for a conservative or a liberal, you're voting for somebody that is going to stand there and vote for whatever their leader tells you to. The Greens have a perfect, uh, have a, 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 um, it is their charter that we are here to represent the people only. It's time for new blood in Ottawa to shake things up. If you want change, the Green Party has that change. Vote Matthew Lund and vote Green for 2019. We started tonight with me telling you that we're in a financial crisis, that we're going to hit $1.1 trillion debt, and that there is wage stagnation. You know, you know that I'm right about the wage stagnation. You know that the wages haven't gone up as the cost of living has gone up. Maxine Bernier wants to balance the budget. He realizes that we're on a collision course for our own finances. He has a five-part plan. Basically, the top three are the, the, the easiest in a one, two-minute speech. Well, we want to get rid of the capital gains tax. We want to get rid of the carbon tax. We want to have a flat tax of 15%. No one's ever tried this, okay? No one's ever tried. Let's see what flat tax can actually do. And everybody talks about the um, 1%. Sure, well then if we have a flat tax, then we, we can deal with the 1%. Now, and then on top of that, we want to get, um, uh, uh, increase the capital cost allowance so that basically what you can do is you can write off all of your money that you put into your uh, business so that you can create jobs. National Citizens Alliance, uh, for myself, I'm not a career politician. Uh, this is my first time running, and it's been very educational, very uh, difficult as well. I hope to uh, do this again. Um, I want to tell you that the National Citizens Alliance, we are not globalist, but we are definitely pro-Canadian. We are listening to real people needs. The National Citizens Alliance does not suggest that we have all the answers. But we are. We do have a comprehensive plan that I would invite you all to look at. We have a professional website, and I would invite you to that. Budget balance will be the law of land with the National Citizens Alliance. We are interested in responsible immigration. It's not to say that it's this color or it's that color. We just want the best to come to Canada. Finally, in terms of lower taxation, we are the only party that has a compre comprehensive taxation plan that will promote business and get Canada back to the competitive nature of the USDA. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's all thank the candidates for being here tonight, putting their names forward, answering our questions. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the members of the Social Planning Council of York Region for putting this together, giving us an opportunity to meet the candidates. And uh, thank you to all of you for participating, for listening, for putting some questions forward. And uh, one thing that you can leave tonight with is don't forget to vote. And get your family members to vote, get your friends to vote, get your neighbors to vote. It's very important. We all engage in the democratic process as we've seen demonstrated tonight very well. Thank you.